In conjunction with our regular December update of the apolitical world map, it's time for our roundup of geopolitics around the world over the past six months in what was a tumultuous half year on the world stage. Things began in June with steadily building momentum for Ukraine's summer counterattack. This continued into the early summer, first with Ukrainian-backed Russian opposition forces taking control of limited Russian territory outside the city of Belgorod, and later with internal chaos within the Putin regime in the form of Yevgeny Prigozhin's failed march on Moscow and the subsequent fallout including Prigozhin's death, the folding of the Wagner Group into the Russian military, and the arrest of other estranged figures such as Igor Girkin. We did videos on each of these events at the time, looking in greater detail. However, despite all the anxiety Ancillary success, Ukraine's counteroffensive itself proved to be far more difficult a proposition. On the counterattack's primary axis, the Zaporizhia Front, the Russians laid belts of landmines hundreds of miles long, also taking the previous year since they'd occupied the territory to construct layers of defensive fortifications. Although not as robust as the defenses in the Donbass industrial area, which not only features more defensible terrain but had been constructed over the course of eight years since 2015, the so-called Surovikin Line in Zaporizhia still proved a tough nut to crack. Things got off to a very slow start with several early setbacks, though Ukraine later adjusted its strategy to account for the lack of air cover, as well as more extensive minefields than Ukraine's NATO partners had anticipated. After the adjustment, Ukraine reverted to more Soviet-style tactics, carpeting an area with artillery to force the enemy to evacuate before sending in ground forces. This meant slow but steady progress in the second half of the summer. By the start of the rainy season, Ukraine had penetrated Russia's main defensive line and are currently establishing fortified positions from within the former Russian trenches. Thus, while the counteroffensive can't be said to have achieved its goals, it nonetheless achieved moderate success, providing a forward jumping off position for further gains. Meanwhile, in the late fall, new offensives began from each side on other fronts. Russia sent thousands of reserves into Avdivka on the Donbass front. Large portions of these reinforcements were destroyed or captured as Russia attempted to bypass Ukraine's 2015 defense lines through grinding frontal assaults. With tactics resembling Wagner's last year at Bakhmut, Russia has advanced field by field and hill by hill, but as of the making of this video has yet to encircle Avdivka. Speaking of Bakhmut, Ukraine engaged in a small-scale counterattack in that theater, taking areas of high ground on the southern flank of the city, as well as two associated towns, Klishivka and Andrivka. Again, that counterattack was small in scale and occurred throughout the summer and fall, with Ukraine now taking up defensive positions on the high ground they've gained. Ukraine's active counterattack in the late fall appears to be on the Kherson front. After recapturing Kherson in the fall of 2022, Ukraine spent most of the year on this axis building small bridgeheads across the Dnieper River, and over the past month or so has expanded this into large-scale operations. Ukraine has gained a substantial bridgehead on the East Bank, with large formations of troops and even some heavy vehicles having successfully made the crossing, often under the cover of the autumn fog. Where this proceeds from here is anyone's guess. Yes, but it should be noted that Russia's southern defenses are much less robust on the Kherson front. While the war in Ukraine drags on, Russia's influence in its so-called near abroad appears to be waning. In September, the Russian brokered peace between Azerbaijan and the Armenian breakaway state Artsakh fell apart, with Russian peacekeepers caught in the middle. We recently took a look at this third Nagorno-Karabakh war in further detail, but in short, Azerbaijan first violated the ceasefire by blockading the territory. Then, after demands to surrender went unheeded, the Azeris launched a fresh offensive, attacking from multiple axes while shelling the capital of the breakaway state, Stepana Kirk. Russia's peacekeepers were now caught in the middle, and several were killed as the fighting continued. Russia, though, did not react, indicating that with its hands tied in Ukraine, Moscow has limited ability to protect its garrisons and enforce its guarantees elsewhere, a major blow to Russian power projection. The conflict was largely over by its second day, as the Artsakh authorities agreed to Azeri terms for a ceasefire, including agreeing to the disbandment of the Artsakh Republic after over 30 years. The remaining civilian population, numbering over 100,000 people, evacuated through the Lachin Corridor, now reopened following the end of hostilities, and fled their homes likely forever into Armenia proper. 
Although this is essentially a mirror image of the refugee situation on the Azerbaijan side in 1992, the human tragedy of those displaced from their homes, likely permanently, is not to be overlooked. Nor is the internal chaos that has been created in Armenia, with the fallout from a seemingly final defeat of Artsakh and the influx of over 100,000 refugees. In light of Turkey's continuing support of Azerbaijan, as well as Russia's dearth of support for its erstwhile ally Armenia over the past five years, and Moscow's inability to respond to the deaths of its own peacekeepers, the geopolitical situation in the South Caucasus appears to be in flux. Back in the summer, we covered the military coup in Niger, a country within France's sphere of influence but hosting American troops as well, which saw the coup plotters appear to turn toward Russia for support, following a similar pattern to other Sahel states, such as Mali and Burkina Faso, across what has become known as the so-called coup belt. These regimes were pitted against ECOWAS, the largely Nigerian-led bloc that suspended the membership of these states. Although initially threatening military action, internal divisions and outside reservations about the bloc's potential intervention have made the use of force unlikely. That said, geopolitical maneuvering in the region will continue as America refuses to evacuate Niger despite the unfriendly regime now in power, and regional actors like Nigeria explore alternative ways to change the situation. France, though, decided to pull out, following similar withdrawals in Mali and Burkina Faso. In the latter two, appeals to Russia for support were met by assistance from the Wagner Group. And since the end of Wagner, that role has been taken over by the Russian state proper. However, like in the Caucasus, Russia's ability to actually hold up its security guarantees has come into severe question. Previously, over a decade ago, France had helped expel Islamists from northern Mali, launching a series of sweeping campaigns including the Timbuktu operation. These were successful, and although the Azawad Tuareg breakaway state in the northeast remained, rebellions of an Islamist nature were largely held on the periphery over the next decade. However, following France's ouster from the country, the Wagner Group and later Russia assumed responsibility for Mali's protection, including against the chronic threat of jihadist forces. After just a short time, the mission is already beginning to look like a potential failure, with a branch of Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb laying siege to Timbuktu in August of 2023, a complete reversal of the progress gained with France's help a decade earlier. Over 30,000 civilians have thus far fled the city, and we will for sure be keeping an eye on its fate as we move ahead. In the Central African Republic, the government has continued to gain ground against rebel forces, with this being a case where Wagner and later Russian support was actually effective. One reason could be that Russia has been embedded here for much longer than in the Sahel, having supplanted French influence back in 2018. When it broke out back in April, as well as during our June geopolitical update, we took a look at the ongoing civil war in the Sudan. Since our last update, not much has changed territorially, with the capital of Khartoum still contested between General Al-Burhan, Sudan's military president, and General Dagalo, or Hameti, chief of the Darfur-based Rapid Support Forces. Major action also occurred in the North Kordofan province during August. Hameti still has not declared any sort of new government in the areas he controls, but on September 14th, he hinted that such a rival regime could be formed. Action continued into the late fall, with the Rapid Support Forces is starting to make gains. Thus far, international involvement has been kept to a minimum. We'll certainly keep an eye on how this conflict continues to develop. In the Horn of Africa, several events took place in the north, including most notably the Los Anad conflict. While turmoil has engulfed the Federal Republic of Somalia over much of the last 30 years, the breakaway Republic of Somaliland in the north, on the territory of the former British Somaliland Protectorate, has for the most part remained a bastion of peace, largely owing to the ethnic homogeneity of the Isak clan. However, since Somaliland declared independence in 1991, the eastern borderlands have always been contested. The Dul Bahante clan, part of the Darod ethnic group, has at times agitated for self-government over the past 15 years since Somaliland came into control of their traditional areas. In the late summer and early fall, armed conflict broke out in the region. Somaliland used its substantial military power to attempt to break up the rebellion. However, they were eventually driven out of multiple major military installations. 
Islands. A new administration was formed in these areas of the Sewell, Sanag, and Kane regions, collectively known as SSC, which proclaimed the creation of the Katumo State, Katumo meaning positive conclusion in Arabic. With its capital at Los Anad, this breakaway state from the breakaway state intended to rejoin the Federal Republic. And on October 19th, it was officially recognized by Mogadishu as Somalia's newest federal state. Although action has since died down, no ceasefire has been agreed to. The federal government also got a boost in the north from Puntland State, which finally drove out the last stronghold of ISIS in the region. However, the much more major Islamist threat of al-Shabaab remains, though in recent months the federal government has made inroads in the center and south of the country. After settling their differences and working together to win the Tigray War, cracks have begun to reappear in the relationship between Ethiopia and Eritrea. A diplomatic spat ensued after comments by reformist Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who made pointed comments about the country's historical disagreement over port access, one of the main sources of past conflict between Ethiopia and its former territory. This was taken less than kindly by the revolutionary Eritrean regime, but for the moment, thankfully, it's all just words and saber-rattling. Abiy Ahmed, meanwhile, has more immediate concerns on his hands. Another partner of the Ethiopian government during the Tigray War, the Amhara ethnic group, has also seen a faction turn its arms on Addis Ababa. The Fano militias began an armed rebellion, which intensified through the summer and saw several major clashes with government troops. As of the making of this video, the rebels have been driven out of the few urban areas they captured, but are still present in large swathes of rural Amhara and neighboring states. They also engaged in inter-ethnic clashes against the Oromo Liberation Army. This group in the West also intensified its actions against the Ethiopian government following the end of the Tigray War, but recently has had its attention diverted to fighting the Amhara rebels. As ever, relations within the old multi-ethnic empire of Ethiopia are a constant challenge for Abiy and his emerging system of government. A major humanitarian situation has emerged in Pakistan. Since the Communist Revolution and subsequent Soviet invasion in 1978-79, as well as all the occasions Afghanistan has changed hands since then, waves of mostly Pashtun refugees flooded into Pakistan. Most have by this point fully assimilated into life in their new country, but never officially received Pakistani citizenship. In all, by the fall of 2023, there were estimated to be around 1.7 million unregistered Afghan refugees in Pakistan. However, the Pakistani government has commenced a program of deportation, with tens of thousands given just hours to pack up all their belongings before being forcefully evicted from their homes. This even included those educated Afghans contributing to the Pakistani economy, as well as students studying in secondary schools and universities. Now they've been forced to flee back to a homeland struggling just to stay afloat. The Taliban regime has set up multiple refugee camps on the border and was compelled to set up religious schools within the camps to continue some form of education. However, the regime has already been struggling to feed the existing population over the past two years and is completely unprepared to deal with the hundreds of thousands of refugees that have already arrived, not to mention the hundreds of thousands more who could be coming in the future, especially with Pakistan's recent opening of three more border checkpoints into Afghanistan. In recent weeks, Pakistan appears to have granted a reprieve to those still in the country, at least through the end of the year, though the Pakistani government still maintains that the situation is untenable long term. In Manipur, ethnic conflict continues to bubble. The indigenous Kuki ethnic group, prominent in the highlands surrounding the capital of Imphal, saw factions publish an ultimatum for the state government. It demanded a separate federal state for these areas, stopping short of demanding secession from India entirely, instead requesting separation from the powers that be in Imphal. The question remains a tricky one for the Indian central government to navigate, but allowing the situation to fester could increase the security risk. In Burma, after two and a half years of mostly stalemate, the war situation has begun to heat up. The Myanmar military, the Tatma Da, has been racked by defections. At the same time, the ranks of the opposition have swelled. 
Previously, since the military coup in February 2021, some of the ethnic rebel groups holding territory around Burma's periphery welcomed in regime opposition and helped train their militia. They also allied with the new government in exile, the National Unity Government. However, limited progress was made, and the new government had essentially no influence on the ground. Now, things have begun to change. More of the ethnic armed organizations have broken with the Tatma Da, joining the opposing coalition. The opposition militia, having been trained by the ethnic armies over the last two and a half years, has also now finally been integrated into the fighting forces. And new offensives have been launched in the south, northeast, and northwest. Along the way, numerous border checkpoints, towns, and other important infrastructure has been captured, now effectively under the control of the National Unity Government and its coalition of ethnic armies. Meanwhile, the CCP-backed autonomous WA state retains its administration in the borderlands. With CCP interests also tied in closely with the Tatma Da, if the situation becomes more dire for the junta, this conflict could become the major geopolitical flashpoint it's always had the potential to be. Over the past several years, a surprising relative detente had emerged in the Middle East. This is not necessarily due to conflicts being resolved, but more so due to conflicts becoming frozen, as is the case in Yemen and Syria, each of which are de facto partitioned. Also contributing were the Arab-Israeli peace deals, collectively known as the Abraham Accords, bringing several regional Arab states, though not yet Saudi Arabia, into line with Israel against their collective adversary, the Islamic Republic of Iran. We looked into the details of those agreements at the time. Since then, a sequel to the original accords has been in the works. This began first with further expansion of ties between Israel and former enemy Morocco. The two countries recognized each other in the 2020 agreements, in conjunction with the deal's broker, America, recognizing Moroccan sovereignty over the Sahara and coming on the heels of American recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. In July 2023, Israel expanded the deal to extend its own recognition of Moroccan sovereignty over the Sahara. Then, into the fall, an even bigger chip was being negotiated, with the Americans attempting to broker what would be a cornerstone agreement, a normalization deal between Israel and the biggest Arab power, Saudi Arabia. Although America was separately attempting to thaw relations with Iran, as well as a Beijing-sponsored deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia, the prospect of a Saudi-Israeli deal being close at hand was not in the Tehran regime's geopolitical interest. It's been widely speculated, although not confirmed, that the steadily progressing negotiations and the potential threat they posed to Tehran and its proxies were a major reason behind the eventual shattering of the detente on October 7th. Hamas forces broke out of Gaza, invaded Israel proper, and laid waste to the border towns. With around 1,200 civilians killed in the most graphic and gruesome of ways, this terror attack was declared as an act of war by Israel, which was delayed in its response but did eventually push Hamas back inside the borders of Gaza. After a month-long campaign of airstrikes, during which Gazan civilians were encouraged to evacuate to the south of the territory, Israel sent in ground troops to besiege Gaza City. As of the making of this video, they've taken effective control over this densely built urban area and are now engaged in the process of rooting Hamas out of its underground tunnels. Meanwhile, most of the refugees from Gaza City have fled to the south, which for the moment remains under the control of whatever elements of Hamas remain there. Iran's other proxy groups in the region have engaged in sporadic but continuous attacks, including Hezbollah firing into northern Israel, and the Houthis of North Yemen both firing missiles and capturing an international cargo vessel linked to Israel, taking hostage the 25 crew members of many varying nationalities, none of whom are Israeli. To counter the threat, Israel deployed naval forces to the Red Sea. At the start of the conflict, America moved a pair of aircraft carriers into the region. On several occasions, Iranian proxies have launched rocket attacks on American bases in Iraq and Syria, resulting in dozens of injured American servicemen. America responded with limited airstrikes to attempt to deter future attacks without escalating the conflict. Although the conflict itself is far from over, the conversation has begun to turn to what happens next in Gaza. 
With the Hamas regime having been toppled, there is a potential for a fresh start in Gaza, but it will not be easy and will require the cooperation and collective brain power of military and security officials, diplomats, and politicians from all involved parties. Successful state building requires a clear plan and end goal, so with this being a situation where failure would have disastrous consequences, great care is likely to be taken to ensure this is done right. Whatever happens, we will be there to document it. Be sure to check out this most recent update to the map at apoliticalworldmap.org. Be sure to like the video and leave a comment. For more content like this, check out our channel page, subscribe, and hit the bell so you know when the next video is posted. And if you can, please join our Patreon to keep the videos coming. For now, thanks for watching. I'm Alex. I am out.